Welcome to this episode of the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges, and joining us today, Paralympic, three-time Paralympic medalist and world champion, two-time world champion in the 50-meter freestyle, Commonwealth Games champion in the 50-meter freestyle. Today, we're sitting down with Katya Dedekind. Katya, thanks for joining us. How are you today? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm good. I'm good. We're in the Olympic year. We're in the Paralympic year. Um, just starting there in this lead up, you've been to two Paralympics now. You've medaled at both of them. Uh, what's what is your focus heading into this year, and how are you feeling heading into uh, what could be your third Paralympics? It's crazy to think that uh, I'll be turning twenty three this year. So it's crazy to think that in my twenty third year of life, I could be potentially going to a third games. Um, if you went back in time and asked fourteen year old me if she was going to make a Paralympics when she did, she would have said no. So it's it's crazy to think I'm potentially going to my third this year and. I think just making a third games at such a young age is an achievement in itself. But I think if I could continue my podium streak at a Paralympic Games, that'd be really nice. I'd like to get a different colour this time. I've got um, got three bronze medals from those two Paralympic Games combined, and I think I could potentially add a different colour to the collection. So uh, I I was looking at uh, you know at your bio. And I didn't see any medals from the 50 meter freestyle. However, you've swam the 50 free at both Paralympic Games. And in the last year, you've won three international golds, two, two at Worlds and uh, one at, at Com Games. So I'm just curious, what do you feel like something has changed for you in the 50 free in the last couple of years? Or what was your experience like swimming it at, at, at your first two games? Um, I think the first games in Rio in 2016, I just turned 15 overseas. Um, it was my first time away from home and from everybody and had to grow up and be an adult. And I think winning a medal at that game was a fluke. I'm going to say it. I've said it every time someone asked me about it. It was a fluke. I turned eighth on the wall and I came third. How? We still don't know. And that um, was in the hundred back, yeah. just for context. In the hundred back, listeners. yes, in the hundred, <laughs> yes, in the hundred backstroke, mm -hmm. um, in an event that I didn't even train for. So that is why <laughs> I call it a fluke because I didn't train backstroke at the time. Um, it wasn't meant to be an event that they thought I was going to medal, and I think I was meant to medal in like the whole hundred free. And nerves got a, a better of me, and I ended up coming eighth in a final, which is still awesome, um, especially at fifteen. So, yeah, it's definitely been interesting. Korea. Um, I have since Tokyo changed clubs. I moved from Sunshine Coast back down to Brisbane and I'm now training with Kate Sparks um, at Yoronga Park Swim Club here in Brisbane in the, in the city. Um, and, you know, since being with her, I've just managed to get this love for the, for the racing back and it doesn't feel like a chore or a job anymore. It just feels like fun. And like, I think I'd like to say like most swimmers, most athletes are adrenaline junkies. And so like getting up behind the blocks and racing um, under Kate, I've managed to get that adrenaline rush back. And so I think that's why the past two years, 2022 and 2023 have been really good is because I've managed to get that drive back. And um, I remember at Worlds in 2022, it was my first competition under the new club, like internationally. And I did come back from an injury. I ended up swimming to the wall too hard and I <laughs> screwed up my elbow a little bit, which is now fixed, thankfully. But um, it was very nerve wracking because it was a new club, um, new experiences and like two new injuries that I was overcoming. And so to, you know, then go ahead and she was like, just have fun with it. I don't care if you go like a 30 and come last or if you break a world record and still come last or come first or whatever. But as long as you have fun, she was going to be happy. And then I managed to come home with a world title and two silvers and then four weeks later go and get the Commonwealth goal in the same event and break the world record, not by a little bit either in a 50. So I think we can all thank Kate for that <laughs> very much. Go and say thank you to Kate for the performance improvement. <laughs> 
Thanks, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate that one uh I, yeah thanks right? <laughs> yeah, i mean that that sounds pretty astounding there are a lot of things in this statement i really liked i've never heard anyone call swimmers adrenaline junkies but i love <laughs> that perspective uh to me swimmers are a little uh boring at times because <laughs> because they're looking at a black line so much that it's that's the, the the ethos of swim training is kind of the opposite of being an adrenaline junkie. It's it's being able to grind it out, right? But yeah, exactly the racing part of it, it I, I totally am with you on that. Is uh, you know you you have to be addicted to that hit that rush of I'm in the race, let's go, right? Yeah, exactly. Like that's what everyone says to me. They're like, how can you train almost every day of the year, looking at the same thing, looking at, looking at the ground essentially, and like training in the hot days where the water's too hot and you're getting sunburned and you're having like blisters on your back. Cause I, I burn so easily. You can see in my face, like this is literally like from two days ago, I'm still red. Um, and it's like, why do you want to get up in, in the early morning when it's dark outside and it doesn't get, light until like an hour and a half into your training session it's cold outside and the water's cold like why are you doing everything and like why do you train nine times a week and gym this many times a week and put your body through hell and do sacrifice so much and it's literally the same answer every time is because i like standing behind a block and feeling like i'm going to pass out because i'm so nervous but once you dive in i always zone out and i forget my race completely but i get out and i just have this rush and i think you can kind of see it on the medal presentation for com games you can see like my whole one side shaking and that didn't stop until the next day i was full of adrenaline i did not sleep that night i remember not being able to sleep mind you i was getting drug tested <laughs> so <laughs> didn't really have a chance to sleep anyway but i was i was just so excited and it's crazy to say but you can't you, you crave that a little bit especially when you're racing because it's a fun experience and you're seeing how fast you can be and if you can be the fastest in the world but it's also just like, I think that that all just comes together. Like you've got the adrenaline, but that just makes you want to go faster. And then that fuels the adrenaline rush because you're like, how fast can I go? And I, yeah. So we are boring, but we are a little, little, little crazy. It, it comes out. It comes out in little, <laughs> little, little spots along the way, right? Comes out in a good way. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, it competitions. Um, that's, <laughs> I really, I really like that phrasing. Uh, I've never heard it before, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I might steal that moving forward. Yeah, you steal it, please do. It's good. So, uh, so, but most of the time, again, swimmers are boring. You're training all the time. Uh, what, what is the new training like? You know, you you switch coaches, um, and you're obviously having success. But has the training for you uh, look significantly different than it did before um it's it's hard to say if it's significantly different or very similar because you know at the end of the day we all train in a body of water and we're all doing certain kilometers between a certain distance and we're all doing this workload um but i think in moving programs number one it was close to my family my, all my family moved back down to brisbane once we finished high school up on the Sunshine Coast. My brother moved down, dad moved away for work, mum moved back down to be with my brother and my dad. Um, and so, number one, I was away. And also all my friends were down in Brisbane, excepting one who I'm actually going to train up to see this weekend, which I'm very excited about. But um, I think being closer to that support network, number one, was really positive and that's helped the training improve. You know, happy swimmer is a fast swimmer. That's what everyone has always said. And if people haven't heard that before, um, you need to start implementing it because it's a very true fact. Um, but also I think Kate has managed to get into my head in the best way possible. And she knows how to switch me on when I can't do it myself. And that's another thing we can be thankful for is because um, in the days where I just don't want to be there, I still show up. I still do my case and she mm -hmm. still just learns how to tick my brain over and work it to the best way possible so i think the training is a little bit different but i wouldn't say it's vastly different but i think like in theory it's not vastly different but in the way we um applicate it and we like try and hit it has definitely been a different approach 
Yeah. What is there? Are you still focusing on the same events or training for the same events? Yeah. So with Paralympic swimming, um, each classification, you know, S1 to S14, we all have different events that we've been allocated. So as an S13, I have the 50 freestyle, the 400 freestyle, the 100 backstroke. I think it's also 100 fly, 100 breast, 200 IM, which I don't do because <laughs> I cannot, my knees don't bend for breaststroke and I don't feel like dying in a 100 butterfly. <laughs> um, so when I was on the Sunshine Coast um, and in Rio's games and I was still living in Brisbane, I was doing the 50, the 400 free and then the 100 backstroke. And so we're still doing that now, but I think we're more so focusing now on the 50 freestyle and the 100 backstroke and becoming a little bit of a sprinter um, based off the past two world championships in the Com Games um, in 2022. It just looks like that's something that I enjoy more, but also can really tap into really well. Yeah, which uh, it makes sense. Who doesn't want to become a sprinter and drop the 400 freestyle? Oh. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I'm not mad about it. <laughs> I'm not mad about it. I know like 400 is the longest event that we have in Paris swimming. So I, I can like give my hat to, you know, everyone who does 800s and 1500s and like the marathon swimmers who do 10K. Like I train with Chelsea Hubecker and she does 10K and they're over in Doha right now preparing for um, their competition happening n next weekend, I think. Um, but man, I'm so happy to drop eight laps. I'm happy to keep it to one or two and then be done with it and still be in the same amount of pain afterwards. <laughs> it's a different, it's a different, distance swimming is a different kind of adrenaline, I think. I'm going to be bold and say it's a different breed of people. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's so. It's a different breed, yeah. just like breaststroke. It's a different breed of people. Like <laughs> you're born a breaststroker and you're born a distance swimmer. <laughs> Three kinds of swimmers. Sprinter, yes. distance breaststroke breaststroke <laughs> <laughs> i think that's accurate uh, and i think most Sorry. swimmers would agree with that as well so oh, good <laughs> so, so looking into your background uh you, as you said you made your first games at age 15 but you, for a long time you were playing goal ball yes which yes, i was playing goal ball for a while uh i don't actually know what goal ball is i don't think we have that in the in the united states can can you give me a brief summary or synopsis yeah so actually you guys do have it in the u.s okay. i think it's i think it's actually bigger than we have it in australia so um goal ball is essentially a sport for visually impaired athletes only um mm -hmm. mainly because you're basically you're all blindfolded and it's the width of a basketball court and you've got a two and a half kilo basketball that's filled with bells. Everyone's blindfolded. The court and the spectators have to be completely silent. And there's ropes on the floor to tell you where you are. And basically you're bowling underarm at each other, hitting each other in the body to try and get over and into the goal. Um, and it sounds very barbaric. And look, it is. I've been hit in so many places and I had bruises all over me. But as I said before, I'm an adrenaline, adrenaline junkie. And that was besides swimming, my favorite sport. And I would have kept doing both if they didn't, you know, clash. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, they do because you land on your hip and your shoulders and goal ball and I need my shoulders for swimming. So unfortunately, I couldn't continue, but um, I think it's a fantastic sport. And I've said to everybody, when I retire from swimming in years to come, I will be doing goal ball again. <laughs> that's exciting. Uh, that, sounds like a, that sounds like a blast. Oh, it's so much fun. And I, when I'm not sure about other countries, but in Australia, when we compete in our own states or um, probably not so much at nationals anymore, but we did include like siblings who had fully sighted, uh, who were fully, fully sighted. Um, I remember I went to like one of my first nationals back in 2011, 2012, and we had, we were versed in like South Australia and they had like two vision impaired kids and one sighted kid and it was just so much fun because they were having fun as well it's not just the visually impaired guys that are having a good time um but yeah i'll be completely honest i do miss it and for a few years in the beginning after rio um swimming was worried i was going to go back to goal ball because <laughs> i really enjoyed it and i kept talking about it all the time and i actually in both rio and tokyo got to go and see the players uh not 
play, unfortunately, because swimming was always on when they were playing. Mm -hmm. But I got to see them in the village. So I got to catch up with some of my old friends, which was really nice. That's so cool. And after after Rio, did you ever actually go back to it or, or play it at all? Or you were just talking about it? I've been back to watch. I've been back to help. This is years ago. Um, I, I stopped going pre Tokyo just because I'd moved back. To, uh, I moved up to Sunshine Coast and Brisbane for a visually impaired athlete who can't drive is very far away. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've been back to see some of the younger guys who are now all grown up and like almost 18, which terrifies me. <laughs> I say that I'm, I'm, I'm only 22, but. Um, I've been back to see some of the guys, but I haven't been back to play just yet because I know I'll hurt myself by accident. <laughs> That's fair. <clears throat> it's a, it sounds like an accident prone sport, but it also sounds like a very fun one. It's yeah. a very fun sport. Very much. Um, yeah. Accident prone, but I'm a very accident prone human as well. So um, you'd think it cross each other out, but no, it just makes it worse. <laughs> so when did you decide that you are only going to do swimming? Um, I think, oh, when was it? I think it was in 2015. I I was doing so much. I was swimming. I was doing goalball. Like, you know, every kid does so many sports or so many extracurricular activities in, in primary school or like beginning of high school. And I was doing, I was in a music program at school. So I was doing piano. I was also like doing singing on the side, um, which we don't talk about anymore because that's a long time ago um goalball and swimming and I was just like I just can't keep up with all of them and I had the opportunity to pursue swimming internationally and professionally and I think I just knew in 2015 that was just when I had to drop everything else and give this a good shot um without any interruptions and I'm glad I did because now I'm like eight years down the track talking to you about my (laughs) swimming career which again if you went back to 2015 or 2015 me who made the decision to drop the other three and pursue swimming and told her this is what your next eight years are going to look like she'd laugh in your face and be like okay nice joke let's let's move on (laughs) at 15 what did what did you see for yourself in your future if anything oh like i'm sure some other like disabled athletes would tell you this but being a visually impaired athlete, I'd like to, I like to imagine myself as one of the least disabled athletes out there. Like I've got all my limbs. The only thing I can't do is drive and maybe read some labels, but that's not the end of the world. But I had so many people telling me that I just wasn't going to excel. Um, I wasn't going to do this. I wasn't going to move out and live on my own. I'd always be dependent on my parents. And then when I got to 15 and was given this opportunity to go without my parents and do something that was unthinkable and everyone told me I couldn't do, it was fantastic, but also so stressful. And so at 15, looking forward, I was like, okay, I'm going to go do this. But when I come home, I'm going to be back on my parents' doorstep and I'm going to be doing so reliant on them. And I'm always going to need mum. And mum and I are going to basically move in together for the rest of our lives. And she's going to be my little like carer, essentially. Um, so I, I didn't actually see this becoming a professional career long term and I didn't see myself excelling as I have now which is crazy because I've done literally the opposite of what everyone would tell me to do they told me that I would never excel well I made my first Paralympics at 15 and I got a bronze medal in an event I didn't even train for which was a fluke but it happened anyway um and now at 22 I got told I'd be living with my parents forever and I'd need their financial support and I'd need their help to get to and from things for the rest of my life well actually i I'm a homeowner and I live by myself and I have a really cute dog who I look after by myself, but I also look after myself by myself. So the 15 year old me did not see any of this actually happening ever, which is actually quite sad (laughs) thinking about it. When did you move out on your own? How long have you? Um, The first time I moved out of home was end of 2021 before I moved back down to Brisbane. I got, I got really sick. I had some surgeries done on my stomach. You know, my struggle with endometriosis hasn't been a secret. So um, I had some surgery and I got quite sick afterwards and I needed my family support to get through it. Um, So moving down was the best option for that. And then moved back in with them, unfortunately. But I've been in this place since 
May 2023. Yes. <laughs> and I mean, as again, as someone who didn't necessarily see mm -hmm. independence for yourself in the future, what has it been like? Has it, how does it compare to those expectations? Everyone says, ask me how I'm going living by myself. And every time I say I bloody love it, I love it so much. Like it's not that like I don't love my family, but it's so much more than I could have dreamed of just having my own space and, you know, coming home from training after a long day and walking in and being like, this is a place that I worked for. This is a place that I've put hard work, sweat and tears into. I've earned it. And I get to walk in and see it every day. And then I open my crate for Duke when I get home from training. And he's like, this, my Duke's my dog, by the way. He's a little English stuffy. And he's like, so happy to see me. And so after being told for so long that I wouldn't be able to do what I've just described and then coming home every day and seeing it, it's like, it's mind blowing. And then I go and tell my friends or people that I meet on the street, who are also you know disabled in some way i'll be like don't let them say no because that's not true it's not true and i'm happy to help until you believe it's not true um and that's been a really great thing to help people see as well actually i i'm sure it is and i agree that it is um that's very inspiring and congrats that that Thank you're you. able to have that level of independence i think that's exceedingly important for anyone who is able to do so yeah exactly wow <laughs> that's great um <clears throat> that's it's that's so cool to hear uh and so just again going back to swimming um and uh, again this lead up into into the olympic and paralympic year um does the training change at all for you does the do you feel like the intensity changes? Do you feel, does, does your schedule change at all? Are you still competing more than you would, less than you would, the same amount? Um, so I was going to go based off like previous Paralympic cycles, but to be honest, leading into Rio, I didn't know I was even going to go for the team. So that yeah. counts that cycle out. And then the cycle leading into Tokyo, instead of being a four-year cycle, it ended up being a five-year cycle. And we had so much quarantine and so much isolation and stuff. So that takes that out. And now leading into Paris, it's a three-year cycle. So for the past three games, I haven't really experienced a Paralympic cycle as it should have been presented, as have a lot of people. So um, I'd like to think that we aren't following a regime to, per se, but we are following what we know works. So... Um, leading up into trials, which we have in June, I believe, could be July. I get my June to July mixed up. They look the same to a visually impaired girl like me. Um, but, yeah, racing almost every month and, you know, just putting in the hard yards. But schedule-wise, yeah, I, I'm i going to take the, the – try and take a year off uni if I can, um, trying to, you know, schedule around work and everything. But – if you have the right support system, it becomes very easy to do so. And now it's just a lot of um, focusing and, and sacrificing things that I might actually want to do. Like some weekends, I'm not going to be able to go up to Sunshine Coast and visit mates. I'm going to have to just stay in Brisbane and recover. And that's perfectly fine um, for the goal ahead that we have in plan. Is there anything specific that you're, you know, uh, assuming that you qualify or we could just say going into trials is there anything specific you're looking forward to about um the third go around of this process you know knowing that again in rio you were very young and didn't even expect to make the team tokyo was its own thing with with the pandemic um you know and, and then this again it's come sooner because of that three-year cycle but you know by all accounts it might be the most normal and and again your you're older now, you're more mature and, and have a lot more experience and kind of know a little bit more of what to expect out of this process. Yeah, I, as, as we said, wasn't expecting to make Rio. So that was awesome in itself. And then when I qualified for my second games, um, I got to do it alongside a lot of people who had made the Rio team, but a lot of new people who hadn't made a team yet at all or had just made a team before. 
that year before. So it was very exciting to see old faces and new faces. But something about this team that we have people going for is a lot of our older teammates have retired, um, which I'm very sad about because I was very close with some of them and I'm still very close with most of them. Um, but what's exciting, and I've said this before so many times, is that we have so much talent and speed coming through in young swimming in Australia, whether it be Olympic or Paralympic, it doesn't really matter. Um, we've got some fast kids coming through and um, through the years since Tokyo, we've had people presenting themselves and making themselves available and putting in the hard yards and you can actually see it. And so what I'm really excited for, for not just myself in particular, but for Australian swimming is seeing who comes to the plate at trials and who puts himself forward and see what we can actually expect in Paris. I'm, I'm really excited about triads, whether or not I make the team. Fingers crossed I do. I would really like to go to the third games, but I think like it's just going to be so bloody exciting to see those young guys come up and just try and grab that spot on the team, but also see us old. They call me old now. They call me a veteran, right? I'm 22, but they call me a veteran because I've been on the team for so long. Um, but see us older guys try and you know, keep our spots. I think that's one of the really cool things about swimming is you get to see everyone fight for that spot, but everyone's so quick in their own regard. So I think it's really exciting, actually. I'm getting really excited talking about it. <laughs> the adrenaline's coming out. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you put an emphasis at all on um, the mental side of your performance, um, I guess, or just, you know, your, your mentality outside of the pool, which I think are two pretty different things, but again, with your natural love of, of adrenaline and standing behind the blocks, I'm just curious um, if you do put any kind of emphasis on on where your mind's at heading into a race. Oh, definitely. Like I learned very quickly in my time being on the team that you need to learn how to separate swimming and yourself as a person. Um, I take, I was talking to a friend about this literally the other day. I take so much pride in myself when I introduce myself to people. I, I go by cat. It's a lot easier than Katya. A lot of people don't really get the pronunciation right and they feel bad. It's a whole thing. I don't mind. But I go by cat now and I was like, oh, hi, I'm cat. Nice to meet you. And then later down the track, they find out about my swimming and they're like, why didn't you tell us about it? I was like, because you're meeting me as a person. You're not meeting me as an athlete. And so I've gotten very good at separating those two mindsets. And so literally as soon as I leave the car park in my Uber to come home at, from training, I switch over to cat the person. And as soon as I drive into the car park of training, it's cat the swimmer. So whenever we go onto a plane to go to like Vic States in Feb, or if we're going over to Paris last year for staging camp before Worlds in Manchester, I switch over. And for that whole duration of the campaign, whether it be a local meet or a international meet that lasts for six weeks, I am cat the swimmer. And so I've gotten, I'm really happy that I've gotten better at switching over because then I just put all the hard work in. And then when I come home from that thing, I can be back and relaxed. So um, I wouldn't say there's like a, like a black and white um, outlook or picture as to what the cat person, the cat swimmer looks like, but it's definitely, a, there's a flick in my brain that I switch. And so when I was racing this weekend just, that just passed, my mum even noticed it because she drove me in. She wanted to come watch because she doesn't get to come watch much anymore. So she drove me in and she's like, you got in the car and I saw your, your switch flick on. And I was like, oh, that's good. <laughs> good to know it still works. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's pretty, I mean, that sounds like such a mom thing though, right? Like only, I feel like only a parent or like a really, you know, close person in your life could could notice something so subtle like that but well yeah literally I've <laughs> it sounds really bad um w when I meet other athletes for the first time it's always at a competition like we don't often go to each other's training programs and then meet each other there that's just not what we do but if we meet somebody like another swimmer it's at a swim meet and so some of the guys on team I met them at trials that year or at the staging camp for that benchmark meet that year. And they're like, Kat, we used to think you're a really horrible person because like you just looked stone cold the whole time, but you're actually a lovely person. And now we know you're just like putting your head down and working hard. And I was like, oh my gosh. 
<laughs> I was like, I'm not a horrible person, I promise. So I've worked on that too. I don't look as scary as I've been told. <laughs> so it's a bit funny um, when people come up to me and be like, oh, you're not as scary as I thought. <laughs> Well, I feel like that's also a little bit on them. I mean, like, it's one thing to see someone look really serious or even scary. And then it's another to assume that because they look scary, they're a horrible person. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's a pretty rash conclusion, I feel like. I know. How funny is it, though? <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm glad they got to see the, uh, the person cat and not just the swimmer cat. When people see the swimmer cat first and then they meet person cat afterwards, they're like, you're actually just full of stupid stuff. I was going to say a really bad word. I shouldn't say that. But he's like, you're just actually full of it. And I'm like, yeah, I am full of it. 90% of the time, I'm absolutely full of it. <laughs> it's, 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 how, it, it's what fuels the other 10%, right? <laughs> yeah, literally, literally. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, Kat, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and chat. It's, it's been great catching up with you and uh, hearing about your entire Paralympic journey and, and can hopefully continued uh, Paralympic journey as we head into Paris. Um, what's, what's one thing you're looking forward to just in the, in the next couple months? Um, again, leading up to trials, but you know, we've still got a few months before, before it's all happening. I'm trying to, pick one thing <laughs> um you know since like since we've had this chat today which i've absolutely loved and it's been a great time and it's been so nice to reflect and go down memory lane with somebody else um i think what i'm really excited about is just to see how fast my team can be um whether or not i make a team this year or the next year or the year after and when i retire eventually down the track you know this team will always be my team um, it's a family, we're a mob and we are together forever. Um, and so I'm excited to see what my team can do this year and I'm excited to see what they can do next year and forever. But I'm, I'm so keen just to see what we can pull out and how quick we can all make each other because I know once we get the trials, we all push each other to be faster than we are. And then when you get to staging and the Paralympic Games, that's just 10 times more. So I'm excited. For the next months of racing to see what my friends and my team can do for sure. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcasts on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.